So I wanted to record a short video about uh, the meaning uh, or significance of um, Harry Belafonte, who just uh, died two days ago. And uh, for me personally, or perhaps also in general, uh, for the world, what this individual signified. And the reason why I'm recording this video is because uh, I personally was quite devastated to find out that Belafonte had died when I arrived back in Brussels two evenings ago. And in fact, I broke out in tears and uh, immediately reached out to a number of friends who I realized actually, many of whom had never heard of Harry Belafonte. And so obviously couldn't understand why uh, this individual whom I had never met, I did not know personally, meant so much to me. So I wanted to record this video. So um, I mean, the facts of Belafonte's life, you can find out on Wikipedia, he was born I believe in 1927, I think that's about right. That would make him about the age of my grandfather. He was 96 when he died this year in uh, 2023. I guess that would be the 25th uh, of uh, April. And um, the um, content of his life is what I really would like to focus on. And in fact, after I finished my own uh, PhD, <clears throat> Uh, studying cooperatives, cooperation in the economy, economic theory, political history, evolutionary theories, theories of ecology, and many other uh, areas, disciplines, and, and silos. The first book I actually grabbed and read uh, from cover to cover was um, My Song, uh, the memoir of Harry Belafonte. And so I was uh, very much enamored by and amazed by the uh, number of lives that he touched and maybe just to, to recount um, what he means to me. And I mean, the, the most significant uh, part of his life, of course, is his activism, his unrelenting uh, principled focus on ensuring that all people in the world have, have rights. And this, of course, he got uh, not out of a vacuum. He always said of himself, I'm not an artist who became an activist, I'm an activist who became an artist. And growing up in Harlem and partly in Jamaica, uh, where his mother was from, he of course saw the difficulties uh, that Blacks, Black Americans, African Americans, uh, you know, Black Caribbeans of course as well, experienced um, personally, uh, as well as uh, in the guise of others, neighbors. And um, and so he was actually in close contact with, and in, in, in later life, a close friend with uh, Paul Robeson, who was another one of my heroes and role models. And Robeson was one individual who convinced Belafonte to pursue the career that he did, because uh, similar to Belafonte, Robeson, one generation earlier, had had miserable um, success in terms of actually pursuing a professional uh, career. Ropes in himself, um, whose father was a, an emancipated slave and a preacher, uh, graduated, uh, I believe, valedictorian uh, from uh, Princeton University uh, with a degree in law and never found any opportunity. He was also an all-American football star. So he, he, he sang, he played sports, he was academically inclined. And he did not find any work, any job in a New York uh, law firm where he tried to find a job, uh, besides being, you know, a, a janitor or something. So no one wanted to work with this very dark-skinned, tall, uh, black man at this time um, in the 20s. So Robeson went into acting and uh, also uh, singing. And uh, in fact, he was quite uh, clearly a prototype for Belafonte, who did exactly the same thing and pursued, in fact, an acting career uh, with a... Uh, Piscator, um, German uh, emigre, in his actor's workshop with people like Walter Matthau and others. And uh, in fact, in this time, he met Sidney Poitier, and another very, very uh, well-known, famous uh, Black actor who also recently died, uh, with whom he had a lifelong friendship and also rivalry. So I'm, I guess, telling the biography, but... Um, uh, yeah, so Belafonte, in fact, uh, perceived firsthand the difficulties of succeeding as an actor, as a Black man. In fact, he was quite uncompromising, and this is the difference between him and Boitier, who took many parts that uh, were not as um, 
flattering to uh, to to himself and to his race. Uh, where in fact this is part of the the conflict between between Belafonte and and Poitiers uh, is is that uh, Belafonte was very uncompromising in what he was willing to play, which roles he was willing to take up, and uh, and which he was not, and so. Belafonte is actually the first black man to be in a uh, A-list Hollywood film to play the leading the leading uh, man man the leading man, and as far as I'm aware, and that's um, Island in the Sun, which I think came out in 1954, with uh, Joan Fontaine playing his uh, his um, love interest, and of course they, if you imagine, I mean this was a a huge scandal at the time, uh, a black man. Uh, falling in love with a white woman in this, you know, again, it's a a a list Hollywood film. You know, this is not one that was playing somewhere in the basement theaters. So many theaters in the South refused to play the film, and in fact, they were not allowed to kiss on screen. So you can imagine it's a romance, and they're not allowed to kiss. So there's one scene in, in the film if you watch it, and I do recommend it. And it's of course there's a beautiful music. Um, of course, you know, this is my, I, I have a cold, so this is my island in the sun built for me since the time has begun and so on. Um, uh, there's a scene where Belafonte drinks from a coconut and um, I think it's Joan Fontaine that drinks from the coconut and passes it to Belafonte who turns the coconut around to the space or the place where she drank from it and drinks from the same place. Uh, this is the closest they ever get to kissing in the film. And even this was very controversial. So you imagine the kind of environment that Belafonte was uh, living in, uh, trying his best to succeed as a black man and being a role model for other black men at a time where nobody was wanting or many were not wanting to hear it or see it. And again, his uncompromising quality, of course, that also carried over into his music career. He was, you know, in over 40 films. Uh, but of course, his, he's most famously known for his uh, very vibrant and unique contribution to popular music, you know, popularizing Calypso and other uh, motifs from the, the, the Caribbean, as well as singing blues and folk music, as you know, with songs of, like by Pete Seeger and others. Um, you know, most famously, the Banana Boat song, Deo, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to uh, torture you with my um, with my uh, ill voice, but um, and in fact, it, early on in his music career, he was attempted to be pigeonholed into a particular style. Uh, he he was to be the next Nat King Cole. Of course, Nat King Cole was the mo the first popular American, Black American, African American um, pop singer, you could say. Paul Robeson as well, uh, at, at around the same time. Uh, uh, were, these were the two great male American, um, African American singers, musicians, whom everyone knew, in fact, uh, but who had many problems. So Belafonte was really not interested in being a crooner, you know, singing in nightclubs, singing uh, standards. And so he very quickly, if you follow his musical career, his earliest records were, are quite, how do I say it, boring, conventional. Um, and he very quickly broke out of this in the 50s and um, insisted on singing, again, on the advice of his mentor, Paul Robeson, whom he regularly met in Harlem. They both lived in Harlem. Uh, to sing his own song. Sing your song is what uh, Robeson told him. And uh, so he began drawing on and exploiting the resource of the, the music of the Caribbean, his own home. And this is what brought out, you know, the great records that, uh, that, that people came to know and associate with him in the 50s, including, of course, Calypso, his most famous record, which was the very first record to ever sell more than one million copies. So he was, again, a incredibly popular uh, and um, yeah, had uh, such an impact. And of course, again, I'm not even getting into all of his activism and uh, which I think is the most important aspect or facet of, of Belafonte's life and his personality. And um, and it's very touching actually to read in his um, memoir, his uh, first meeting with Martin Luther King, uh, which I think also was about, uh, about 1954, if I'm not mistaken, King was giving a talk at a Baptist church in New York, 
and had arranged prior to actually meet with Belafonte. He had, they had had a phone call. There's actually a piece in today's uh, New York Times about this phone call. And uh, Belafonte recounts in his memoir, meeting King in the basement of this church and being immediately uh, impressed by this, this, well, not very tall man with a great presence and being, um, so to speak, infected from that day on and uh, chaining himself to the, the, the fate of, of this man and the movement that he was representing. And so from that moment on, uh, Belafonte was a, until the end of you know King's life in April of 1968, uh, probably the, the best friend and closest confidant of, of Martin Luther King, in addition to being a financier of the entire civil rights struggle. So he personally uh, bankrolled um, many of the events and many of the uh, initiatives of the civil rights movement, including the providing for buses uh, for many of the uh, events, including the, the March on Washington in 1963. He uh, paid for the buses. He uh, paid for bail. He bailed, again, man, many know the letter from a Birmingham jail that Martin Luther King, of course, famously wrote. It's a, you know, a, um, a classic in um, activist literature, along with uh, Henry David Thoreau's On Civil Disobedience and, um, and other works by Tolstoy, Gandhi, and others. Uh, but it was uh, Belafonte that actually paid to get King out of jail at, in this in this case, and many other cases, and many other people, in fact, that he helped over the years. And he really, as I uh, say, he hustled uh, around the country in Hollywood, you know, getting in touch with people like Charlton Heston, who was not particularly progressive, but he said it would be good to have Moses on board for some of these events. Um, and of course, he was a wonderful, charming guy. Charming personality and had the the the, the charm to, to to of his conviction to to convince others, and um, and so he really used his platform. He used his his privilege to uh, help uh, others who, who who were not as privileged or as famous, and um, so so. What else can I say about such a great man? I um. Myself always um, compare myself to 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 or try to, to compare myself to someone like Harry, someone like Paul Robeson, uh, and and others who really very selflessly sacrificed many privileges, um, and they could have you know led a very good life. I mean, Belafonte was a very attractive man and had you know probably sex with most of the <laughs> great stars of uh, female stars of Hollywood, and he could have just had a very um, uh, hedonistic lifestyle, but in fact, he gave back to his community, to the African American community, to the African community, and in fact, he started a, a career, you could say, for uh, one of the most famous South African singers, Miriam Makeba. He, uh, who had lost her passport because of her protests against the apartheid regime, uh, and in fact, he got her her first gig in New York at a the Village Vanguard, if I'm not mistaken, and. Um, and then later a record contract that he then helped her later to get out of, to get into a better uh, situation. So uh, he helped Nana Muscori, uh, uh, and many, many others, uh, singers, actors. He uh, was uh, an, a spearheaded initiatives to, to stop the blockade of the United States on the island of Cuba, uh, and which enamored him in the eyes of Fidel Castro, with whom he had meetings. He um, was always uh, opposed to imperialism and war. Uh, he was very critical of um, of George W. Bush's administration, which many people today forget in the face of Trump. And I've even heard people say, well, they, they miss Bush, but they forget, you know, Bush uh, really created the situation we are in today by offering in 2008 unconditional support for Ukraine joining NATO. So really creating the dynamics, the geopolitical dynamics that we are uh, sitting and shitting in today, so to speak. And um, and so he, Belafonte called George W. Bush the greatest terrorist in the world, um, which cost him dearly. And in fact, as I mentioned, uh, Belafonte was the best friend of Martin Luther King. And of course, so he was also very well acquainted with Coretta Scott King. And uh, during her, uh, after her death, I think in 2006, 2008, uh, he was not invited to the funeral um, because George W. Bush was attending. And um, and so obviously there was animosity there. So um, 
again, Belafonte was always uh, on the right side of history, you can say, and he continued his activism until well into his 90s. He supported, um, I mean, for, for better or worse, certainly uh, as a candidate, uh, Bill de Blasio was a progressive uh, voice, and uh, he Belafonte spoke at his inauguration, uh, again, in New York, and speaking of the Dickensian uh, referring to Charles Dickens' quality of life in New York City, you know, referring to a tale of, of two cities, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times, um, pointing out the um, fate of many of uh, New York's residents uh, living in poverty while, you know, these um, high rises are, are being built for foreign investors and other uh, ultra-wealthy. So the the contrasts uh, in, could not be clearer in a, in a city like New York, his home. And so I, I think I could speak for hours and hours about, um, about this great man. And I just wanted to make this short video for others who may have never heard of uh, Harry Belafonte. There is a, a documentary uh, called, uh, I think, Sing Your Song. <laughs> Again, the quote from Paul Robeson. Sing your song, it's called. It's a wonderful documentary, which shows, you know, again, how Belafonte even again, in his later years, um, supported causes. He was uh, part of the USA for Africa. You know, you've heard him in the song, We Are the World, uh, supporting uh, funding for uh, to fight famine in Africa. He was a um, uh, UNICEF representative in, in Sudan and other countries in Haiti. Uh, you know, he <laughs> could go on and on. Um, actually helped to organize um, young um, people in in Los Angeles who had um, basically gotten involved in gangs, getting them involved in music, you know, rap music or hip hop, uh, basically helping young uh, black men find their way back to society and finding some meaning in art, in artistry, in, in music. Um, so, you know, he, he broke down barriers. He's... Um, in every way I, I can uh, imagine a role model for, for myself and for others. He was unafraid, he was uncompromising, uncompromising and, uh, and, and never, you know, never hid behind any rhetorical uh, devices and, um, or shied away from, from conflict. Um, so to me, I think uh, Harry Belafonte is one of my most favorite uh, people who've um, ever lived and, uh, and I was very sad to 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 seen him um, pass. And in fact, I had just started a letter uh, to Belafonte uh, two days before he died, uh, to thanking him for all of his uh, life's work. And um, perhaps I'll publish that letter someday. Um, so, but I hope if anyone sees this video and they have never heard of Harry Belafonte, that uh, perhaps I have started an interest. And yeah, I recommend just reading more about him and listening to his music, watching his films. And and uh, yeah, um, maybe this documentary would be a good start. And his memoir, which is uh, it's a, it's a very fascinating read. It's a quick read. My Song, I think it's called. All right. <laughs> 